Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH, and today we're going to look at something that's super cool that I've wanted to look at since 2016, and that is this thing. Now, this is actually the HP EasyConnect EC200A or EC200A. At STH, we have been working with the Intel Xeon D series for many years since it was initially launched. And this was really one of the first HPE systems or HP systems because it was in that kind of transition period where this was their Xeon D offering. Inside the HP ProLine EC200A, we get an Intel Xeon D 1518 processor, which is a quad core, very low power processor, which we've seen on a number of different systems so far. Now that embedded processor, HP has actually taken and put in a system around it that is really useful for edge deployment scenarios. So they really targeted the system towards retail locations, towards schools. And the idea here was that you would have a small micro server that you could put on site, you could run native apps locally on that in that location. And then you know, you can connect it to the cloud later if you wanted. Now HP actually sold this with a software solution from Zenstra and really kind of thought of this more as a managed solution. So instead of this being a model where HP just says, Okay, here's your box, go put whatever you want on it. This was kind of more sold with a solution in mind. And before we get too far, there are a couple other regional variations. So for example, I haven't really seen this outside of Japan, but in Japan, there was a instead of EC200A, there was a TM200A. And the TM200A was actually really interesting, because that not only had an option for the Xeon D 1518, but also the Xeon D 1537, which is an eight core part. Now we don't have those models. I, do, I haven't really found a lot of documentation of those outside of Japan. So they may have been a regional specific model, but still that's something that you can maybe look for. And especially if you're located in Japan, I would totally look for those. Now what we don't have access to is we don't have access to the Zenstra solution because we just kind of got this box. It was literally $150 on eBay and a whole bunch of people in the STH forums have been buying them because they're very inexpensive. Now, that may seem really inexpensive, but at the same time, you get a system that there are some things that there are some big drawbacks, especially that $150 price point that I want you to be aware of. And so we're going to talk about those as we go through our hardware overview. So getting into the HP EC 200 a is super easy. And now first off, you go and you have these two screws. And the nice thing is that HP actually did the little extra design feature to keep those screws retained. So they're retained in this outer edge over here. And you just simply pull this thing apart after you've unscrewed it, the top pops right off, and you get inside of the case. Now before we get too far into the internals of the system, I just want to actually talk about this little case here. Now you can see that we have the HPE logo here. Cool. We have the front panel. Great. But then you can see on the inside of this that it looks kind of like there's metal or something. This is not metal. This is actually maybe genuine synthetic faux metal or something like that, aka it's plastic that's painted to look kind of like metal, which just kind of feels cheap. So let's get inside the system and look at some of the really cool things that HPE did and some of the things that we wish HPE would have done a little differently. Okay, so first off, looking at the chassis, you can see a couple of key features. And the first one is that there are two drive bays internal to the system. And you can see that HPE has wired two SATA connectors and the connectors that bring both power and data in there and they have custom length cables. So it's actually a beautifully wired solution. Now our particular unit did not have the three and a half inch bay drive trays. Now on the STH forms, there's someone that actually has a 3D printable version of them. And we have a couple pictures that one of our four members of Mo actually got for us. So we're going to go take a look at that right here. And you can see that you'd normally just put two three and a half inch drives here. Now, if you want to go put SATA drives, the amount is a little bit easier because you can use things like Velcro or whatever you need. And so that makes life a little bit easier. But if you do want to use hard drives, you can. The next thing I just wanted to talk about real quick is that on one side of the chassis, you can actually find two DDR4 DIMM slots. Now this system takes ECC R DIMMs or registered DIMMs. So you can use higher capacity models. You can't necessarily use 120 gig models, but you can use a little bit higher capacity like 32 gig dims and get up to 64 gigs of memory. No problem in the system. We didn't try going higher than that, but no problem on 32 gig registered dims. You're also going to see this nice little fan. Now there's a single 40 millimeter fan in this unit, which is really not huge. I mean, it's a pretty small fan for a system like this. 
And that kind of shows how great the HP thermal design is that they are able to get away with just such a small fan. You can see a small heatsink that sits behind that fan and that's there to cool the processor. Now, the Xeon D 1500 series doesn't have a PCH on board. So there's really one major component to cool. And you also don't have to cool 10 gig ethernet phis. You don't have to really cool the ILO 4 controller too much. And so you don't see a whole lot of heat sinks actually in this chassis. Again, now what you're gonna see kind of next to that fan and the dims and those drive bays is another metal section that goes throughout the chassis. And you might say, oh, that's metal, very fancy. Well, it turns out that's actually not metal. It's actually another genuine synthetic metal or plastic that's painted to look like metal. In pictures, this thing looks like it is a super amazing piece of engineering that must be very heavy and very exciting, but it turns out that most of it's just made of plastic. Now, something that's a little bit different here is when I first look at the inside of the system and I saw the heat sink and the fan, and then I saw the dims, I was scratching my head because I was like, wait a sec, why in the world is the Xeon D processor over there, but the dims are further down in the chassis? Usually you have to have the dims a certain distance from the SOC because memory trace lengths are what they are, and you can't really run them that well that far. And so it turns out that the processor, the SOC is actually sitting under that genuine synthetic metal or plastic crossbar, and you have the dims directly next to it. But then HPE uses a heat pipe to go and push heat from that SOC over to the heat sink and the fan on the system. That's not necessarily terribly exciting other than the fact that it's just kind of a cool design feature that HPE has in the system. Now you might be looking at this and saying to yourself, wait a sec, now why is there a giant high density PCIe connector in this? And there's also all the space up there. I mean, what the heck is going on here? And it turns out that HPE actually put up to four NICs on a single expansion board PCB. Now, instead of doing this kind of how everybody else would do it, which would be to use a standard PCIe slot or potentially maybe like a mezzanine slot, like a flex LOM slot or something like that, HPE said, oh, why do that when we can make something way more complex than it needs to be? And so we don't have this, which is a total bummer, but you can get a quad port NIC and you put it basically on top of this whole section and it takes up the entire section. It goes up to the top of the unit where it eventually gets to the back IO and you add four RJ45 ports to it. That is an incredibly complex solution, but it's basically there to add more networking because if you look at the back of the system, there just aren't that many network ports. There's basically a WAN port, LAN port, and then the ILO management port. So there are a total of three ports on the back. Now, just in case you were wondering, the Intel Xeon D 1518 actually supported 10 gig ethernet. It's kind of a bummer that HPE didn't just take advantage of the built-in NICs and put the networking directly on the motherboard. Now that's something that we really saw from vendors like Supermicro. And for example, the Supermicro, I think it was the X10 SDV 4C or 4C plus models that use the Xeon D 1518. They had features like two 10 gig network ports and two one gig network ports built into the motherboard plus the management port. And I think that's a much better solution than this kind of piecemeal solution where you have to have a riser that's non-standard riser. I just, it just kind of is really annoying. And one of the biggest reasons that it's annoying is just frankly, I have a system now that I can't get these extra NIC ports on because we just can't get the boards for any kind of reasonable cost. And places that I called up to order of them, they actually said that just to order this part was gonna take about 28 days. Now, rounding out the rear IO, we actually have a couple of interesting features there. We already mentioned the WAN port, the LAN port, and the ILO management port, but there's also a legacy VGA port 2, USB 3 ports, a power port, and then you'll see this little blank here. Now that little blank, it says is an optional port for future expansion or something like that in the manual, but it turns out if you look at the shape of it, it's actually just an HDMI port. Now we don't get HDMI on here, but what is interesting is if you look inside the system, what you're going to see is that there is a unplaced component there called GPU ROM. So clearly there was some thought about putting a GPU in this type of system. So in the front of the system, just to round this out, we did have a two USB port configuration. There is a one that's listed as SS, so that's a USB 3 super speed port, and then there's a normal USB 2 port. The Xeon D 1518 and 1500 series has pretty limited USB potential compared to what we have today, especially USB 3, and so that's just kind of what we get. But there is a little bit more to the system than simply what's inside and on the rear panel IO, front panel IO, and all that kind of stuff. Because, well, HPE did think a little bit further ahead. And for example, 
So let's take a look at the bottom of the system real quick. And what you're gonna see here is that we actually have an M2 port, which is for things like an NVMe SSD. So if you wanna go put that, you can go add an NVMe SSD here. Now you're also gonna see this connector right here. And what this connector is, is if you peel off this little piece of rubber right here, what you get is a connector. And you might say, well, why is there a connector on the bottom of the system? So it turns out that the way that HP sold us was that you could have internal storage, plus you could have an external storage shelf. And basically what that external storage shelf did was it gave you another four SATA drive base. So if you think about the system, you could have this little system on top, which had two drives, plus you could have four drives on the expansion unit and get a total of six drives. Commonly, you'd see that expansion system with four four terabyte hard drives, which gives you a total of 16 terabytes. And if you had another two four terabyte drives inside, that gives you a total of 24 terabytes, which is actually not bad for an edge server, especially of this era. HP had other mounting options. So they had a wall mount, they had a mount that would go and kind of make this look really cool on a desk. And so there were a couple different mounting options as well. That's something to look at. And we really haven't found that disc shelf for a reasonable price yet. So we haven't purchased one. Something that's just kind of really interesting is that the ZND 1500 series supported six SATA ports. And what we have here in a max configuration, basically with that expansion chassis is a total of six SATA ports. I don't know if that's exciting, but that's what we have. And for those that are thinking about this system and saying, oh, well, do I get HP Smart Array or anything like that? You don't in this generation. This is all Intel PCH, which is now in the Xeon D SOC, but this is actually Intel SATA ports, not a fancy Smart Array solution. Now on the management side, we actually get ILO 4, which is really cool and it was a great solution. Now we're on ILO 5 now, so it is a generation behind, but we did get some features that are really good for this generation. Like for example, you might actually see that there's these little tiny set of switches here. We'll get a photo and make it look a little bit better, but those little switches actually have features and you can do things there, such as you can set the system into high security mode, you can, lock your configuration there, all of those types of ILO security features you actually have access to even in this small platform. The other kind of fun bit about the ILO chip itself is the fact that it's labeled with the old HP logo, not the new HPE logo. Now there's a period of time where HP, HPE were one, and then Hewlett Packard Inc. and Hewlett Packard Enterprise or HPI and HPE actually split off. And it was actually a project that I worked on when I was still doing consulting. I kind of helped with doing the contract separation between those two. So this system seeing the HP logo and the HPE logo together is actually kind of a little bit fun for me. Something we did want to cover real fast is just the fact that because this is the HPE model, not a kind of more general purpose model, we do have all the firmware and BIOS updates, all that kind of stuff behind a paywall, even though these are kind of older systems. And the importance of that is just that if you purchase a system, especially secondhand, or if you don't have a support contract, your support contract ran, ran out because maybe you know, you got the system three years ago. This is going to be one of those systems that you don't necessarily get updates for. And that's a real bummer because the super micro equivalents like the X10 SDV series, they're still getting BIOS and firmware updates. I also think that ILO 5 was a huge upgrade just in terms of functionality over ILO 4. And so that's just something to keep in mind, but there is a remote management solution with a dedicated port. Okay, the last thing on the hardware side we're gonna look at is the power brick. Now this is a 120 watt unit. And if you look at the connector and you look at the brick itself, you're gonna look at it and say, hmm, I think I've seen this before. Now it turns out if you do have that four disc expansion module, what you actually go from is this 120 watt unit up to a 180 watt power supply. And you might say, hmm, wait a sec, 180 watts? Yes, that is very similar to what we see in the HPE ProLiant microserver Gen 10 Plus, which uses a 180 watt power supply. What we see in terms of power consumption is that at idle, you're gonna see power consumption usually in the mid 20 watt range. So maybe 24, 25, 26, 27 watts, somewhere in there. The ZND 1518 really never got to a super high power consumption, but if you do put things like hard drives in there, you can up that power consumption a lot, especially at startup. And if you get the PCI expansion model, you put a, a NVMe SSD, you get everything running in there. I actually think that the 120 watt is probably a little too much for what you're gonna see in this system, but it's gonna vary a lot based on the configuration. So overall, I think this is an absolutely super cool system. And it's one that really, if you think about it, the HPE micro server Gen 10, if this was this system, I think HPE would have done a lot better with that. 
it has all the features that you really want, and it would have been a great competitor to something like Supermicro. What HPE was going through, especially in this period, is that they were doing things like they were bundling the microserver Gen 10 with ClearOS, they put Zenstra on this system, and so they were at this model where they were trying to figure out, okay, how do we go and pull a lot of money and a lot of margin out of the SMB space? Inevitably, what happens is, that HPE had to go and look at some of these smaller ecosystems. I mean, ClearOS ecosystem is nowhere near as big as something like a Red Hat or a CentOS ecosystem. It's just not that big. But what they were able to do is they were able to go put together a solution that had that OS, some of the higher end features, but they also had a subscription model, which meant more recurring revenue for the companies that were involved. And the same thing on this, where you have Zenstra and you have a managed IT solution where you can go put this out. And then there's some kind of subscription revenue that comes in as well. Frankly, I think that was a big strategic mistake for HPE because at the end of the day, a lot of the SMB market or edge market, what you tend to see is you tend to see people that like to do things themselves. I mean, frankly, if you're gonna go buy an edge server instead of just putting something in the cloud or using something like a Synology unit or whatever, right? You don't necessarily wanna go be burdened by something that looks like an enterprise licensing model. But here we have the enterprise licensing model for firmware. We have enterprise licensing model for the software that's on there. And it's not Microsoft Windows Server. This is something that's different. It's a much smaller ecosystem with Zenstra than a lot of these bigger ecosystems. And I just don't understand why HPE insisted on using smaller ecosystem partners rather than just going and saying, okay, we're gonna go make this really easy for people and we're gonna offer you know, a Windows solution, we're gonna offer a Red Hat or CentOS solution, we're gonna offer a Canonical solution. I mean, I just don't understand why that didn't happen. And I think that's a really good example of why the Supermicro X10 SDV series was super popular because you didn't have the paywall for firmware. You could put whatever you wanted. You could put VMware, ESXi was really popular on that. You could put Linux distributions, you could put Windows, you could put anything you wanted on the Supermicro solution because they aren't trying to burden it with all of this bloat from some vendor that people a lot of times haven't even heard of before. So if you head over to the STH forms, we actually have a giant thread on these systems because people have been buying them for only about $150, which makes them super affordable. But there are some drawbacks. Now, the first off is because HPE isn't using the standard PCIe card, you can't put just a normal NIC in this thing. You have to go find that specific HPE part, which is another thing that Supermicro do better. They use standard PCIe slots. And so if you are trying to buy one of these systems today, there really isn't a great stock of the quad port NICs that go into the system. And so you're pretty much gonna be stuck with the ILO port, the WAN port and LAN port. So you're gonna have a pretty light networking configuration. And you're not gonna get 10 gig ethernet, which you got on the Supermicro boards and boards from other vendors as well. So there are a lot of drawbacks to a system like this, but again, at $150, I think that a two port NIC Xeon D 1518 system is totally cool. You also only get two DIMM slots instead of four, which limits your memory capacity. But again, this is only the quad core processor. So I think that, you know, if you use 32 gig DIMMs, you have 64 gigs of memory and you have a four core processor. I think that's absolutely plenty for what this is intended for. At $1,600 today, I don't necessarily think that this is a good buy, but on the $150 specialist that everybody's been buying on the STH forums, I think that that is something that is totally worth taking a look at. Hey guys, if you made it this far, why don't you click subscribe, turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with new videos. And as always, thanks for watching and have an awesome day.